Hello, uh, John McConnell here. Uh, I'm an attorney, a real estate broker. I'm coming from actually bright. It's a Saturday morning. I am uh, broadcasting from the home office today. I see a little flicker. I think that's because I got my monitors. I purposely tried to use my monitors with white to light up the situation. The camera I have, you can see there's a camera stand back here actually that uh, I was trying to use to get a good angle. It wasn't as good as the office. The office, I have a big white wall I can sit behind. And uh, for Christmas, I've got a monitor, I mean, a, a great, uh, sorry, a great microphone coming. And uh, we'll, the production values are going to go up. In the meantime, this is our very first Google Hangout broadcast. Uh, I was prompted, I was still, I was going to wait until um, January 1st to start this. That was my New Year's resolution. But I got a perfect letter sent to my website uh, from a person who I thought I knew from my uh, from playing golf, but it's a different person, and uh, he asked if I could review his uh, approval letters. Now, in the past, when I was very busy with short sales, I approved, I went over approval letters for clients, uh, but for other people I charged, I just said, you know, uh, well, before deficiencies were um, taken care of by California law, I used to say, you better just talk to someone else, because so often I'd read an approval letter, and there was no anti-deficiency language, and I'd have to explain to them uh, there were multiple reasons why they could be concerned about this fact, uh, from taxes to potential collections after, um, you know, within, say, uh, the statute of limitations period. Uh, but then when the law passed, it was easier, and sometimes I didn't even charge people. So I was faced, there hasn't been, a, you know, short sales now or people who lose jobs or things like that. We look sort of back at the uh, background level of normal short sales in uh, a lot of places in Southern California, although I understand. And the rest of the country, there still are a lot of short sales. So um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to see, and this is the first time I'm actually going to do it. I tested it once. Uh, we'll see if I can now cut to the, um, the approval letter that we're going to review. So basically my point right now is if you were a client and we were going to review an approval letter, you're sitting in my office, or we would do it over the Internet now for at least 70% of my clients. Uh, this is what we would go over, and this is what I, I would explain to you. Um, if you are not in San Diego, we do short sales from LA down to the border. Uh, I've got agents in my office that uh, live in different areas, and that's what we do. Uh, so, but you have a choice. If, if you still are doing short sales and you appreciate the fact that 2014 is a little different, uh, which we're going to go over right now, and you'd like us to be in charge of your short sale or even a regular sale, if you'd like to have an attorney reviewing all your paperwork, you can come to us first. Uh, John at favoritemillestate.com or J, my first initial, M-C-C-O-N-N-I-N -N at gmail.com or call my cell phone or uh, let me give you my, since this is Google, let me give you my uh, Google voice number that cat, that finds me wherever, uh, wherever I am, 760-896-4663, 760-896-4663. Uh, you can have me as an attorney uh, set up, uh, I've sold as a broker well over 100 properties, uh, 70 in 2012. Alone, and um, you know we can set you up so that uh, you know you've got asset protection questions. You want to know how to take the property. Uh, you're you're concerned about uh, you know higher end properties. Don't even use the car forms usually. They like to set it up. I've seen two pagers out of Rancho Santa Fe for um, many million dollar homes because uh, their lawyers like to you know the seller's lawyer likes to limit the buyer's opportunities, take it out of the contract, and uh, you know sometimes that's what they do. So. There might be a million. You might want to tighten down your contract. You might want to be a buyer and, and make sure you have all the opportunities. But anyway, uh, we'll go over this in different programs. Right now, the point is, if you come to see us first, even if you want to work with another realtor, because I'm also a real estate broker, I, I can arrange to get a referral from the listing agent or even the buyer's agent, and uh, you can work with an attorney overseeing your transaction at no out-of-pocket cost to you. Um, that you know, to me, that just makes a lot of sense. Uh, over time, maybe as you see more of this, you'll be comfortable. And you, maybe you'll even know when you need a lawyer and when you don't. Uh, sorry for the long windup. Uh, I'm now going to bring in the uh, the pitch. Um, and let me see. I'm, but this is the first time I'm doing it, so I have to figure out how to bring the document over into here. I don't want Google Effects. Control room looks like it could be useful. Q and A that would be good at times. But here I got it. A second from the top screen share. So. I should disappear for a moment, and uh, maybe we'll come back to wind it up. Uh, I'm going to still click on it, so I'm going to full screen on my monitor over there. This is one of the reasons I'm doing this in my home office as well. 
because I have multiple monitors set up well. Okay, so this is uh, the first clue. Obviously, what I would normally state is uh, I would only let my reviews here apply to California properties, properties in California. You can be out of state, but your property is here for me to be licensed to talk about it. I am also licensed as an attorney in uh, Florida, which is a different state. Here we're a lien theory state, there they're a mortgage theory state. So I understand the difference between mortgage theory and lien theory, and it used to be very important. Uh, I, I, however, I'm not in Florida anymore, and uh, I'm not up to date with my continuing education requirements. So although I am in good standing and licensed there, I'm not supposed to practice law in Florida. So if I was, if I uh, speak of mortgage theory state, it's sort of like a, uh, what you might learn in law school about mortgage theory. Uh, in California, I am licensed to speak about this. I uh, and, and and I shall. So here we have. The sale price is seventy thousand dollars. This was one of my first concerns that we're either somewhere out east in California, in which case everything that I say would apply, or your property might be out of state. I um, I saw it was sort of redacted, but it looked like the the, um, the seller's home address, which isn't necessarily the property's address, is not in California. So the first thing is, if you are not in California, some of the things I say about taxes apply. But some of the things um, that are California specific will not apply. So, uh, but let's review this as if it was a California property. Now and then I'll make a distinction. And let's say it's 700 instead of 70. Uh, so the the lender would want to get a net of 64,000 or 640,000. They're leaving the rest for costs, uh, which would usually take the uh, realtor fees, uh, property taxes. Sometimes are covered. Uh, basically, you want to review everything and make sure uh, there's zero net to you at the closing. The escrow should be able to tell you that. Um, it's usually not an issue now. Most most people have been doing this for a while. Get that stuff straight. And uh, in California, particularly, there should be no out-of-pocket costs to the seller. Um, so now they say check final HUD. See the original sign short sale affidavit to the address listed below. Than 24 hours. Normally, those affidavits are certifying that it's an arm's length transaction or something like that. Again, it's good to be reviewed. Generally, there's not a lot of alarming stuff unless you are selling it to someone you knew ahead of time. And then it might be a question of whether it was just a person who said, hey, I'll buy your house, or it was a brother or a cousin. Um, it's my advice to never lie under oath. So uh, the short sale affidavits might make a difference to some people. Realtor commissions, well, realtors get paid. They're getting paid by the bank in short sales, so most sellers aren't really alarmed by any of that. Closing costs, uh, this should cover escrow and other things. That That's a that's actually a little high. Considering the price of the transaction is low, that's a pretty fat number for uh, escrow and closing costs. Uh, maybe it corresponds to the HUD. Uh, I've seen them try to shave people down to 500 750 and then you have to go back and negotiate with them. Uh, good. This is good. Sellers contribute zero at closing. Hold on, I'm taking a sip of uh, my drink. The property is sold as is. That's pretty standard in short sales. Buyers have trouble sometimes working within the confines of that because they're not happy with the house. Generally, the selling agent has to explain the client's not making any money on this. In fact, he might have put money in the house and is losing. He's really not uh, looking to make any repairs ahead of time unless he's worried about. Um, the deficiency, in which case you might try to make it, you know, better short sale and put a little money in than a foreclosure. But I have no reason to believe this is the case. That when this approval letter was forwarded to me, I have no background other than can you review it? Uh, if a subordinate lien exists, CCO must receive a written and signed commitment from the subordinate lien holders within 48 hours. Uh, this usually became a pro it was a problem in the beginning, but by the middle and the end. Escrow title and most sellers agents understood they had to get all the liens released in order to let the property go free and clear to a buyer, which is usually required by a buyer with a mortgage. Funny things can happen when it's a cash buyer. Uh, hopefully, your professionals involved in the transaction, uh, escrow title, depending on you know. I have a feeling this is in California, so you might call them other things. Uh, it might all be a part of title, 
might be a short sale attorney. It might be a closing attorney. Um, I, I, you know, but hopefully your professionals have experience and they know they're not going to do a short sale unless they've got uh, a um, cooperation from all the lien holders. And in this case, uh, I'd like to bring your attention to uh, record a full release of liability of their lien. Okay, so liability of the lien, th this is where we get into mortgage theory versus loan theory. Uh, does this mean that the lien comes off the property so buyer can take it full, or does it also mean that your uh, responsibility to pay off a loan that's usually associated with that lien is also fully released? Um, if I'm a careful seller and I'm not in California, I talk to my legal professionals. I, 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 you have to ask more people than me because I don't know even know what state you're in. But I like to see, back when this was important in California, uh, I like to see the short sale deal with two issues. One, liability for the remaining loan balances. Two, and this happened every time the short sale. This was on, almost automatic as part of the approval letter, release of the lien so the property can be sold. So, I, you know, it, it's two things that have to happen. Uh, this language uh, would lead you to at least figure out what's going on. You may only have a first lien, in which case uh, what we just said still applies. At the moment, we have not seen any sort of release of lien from the remaining loan. So you're so since it's not written according to the contract here, this is you can look at this sort of as a contract. Um, what does the law say in your state? And we'll get to what the law says in California. Subordinate lien holders within 48 hours of closing. Uh, I'm sorry, I already read that. Any other lien holders, including delinquent condo homeowners association tax liens and sellers. Responsibility and not and will not be paid from closing. Um, that still happens in California. Uh, so sometimes buyers want to pay that stuff. Maybe they want to pay it off before. Uh, we also typically, because prices went up and buyers are usually willing to pay close to the fair market value, in in almost all our short sales now, these things are covered by the bank or they just don't do the short sale, in which case you got to figure out what's going on. Um, but here, they're saying the buyer's paying for it. Well, here they're saying it's the seller's responsibility. A seller's agent may make sure the buyer's paying for it. Uh, again, as a seller, I, uh, I want to be prepared. I want to know this stuff ahead of time, figure out our strategy and our positioning so that a little or no money comes out of the seller's pocket as it's not supposed to in California anyway. Um, CCO mortgage must approve the final HUD. That's sort of standard. Escrow sends the HUD in, hopefully, to a separate department that just says, oh, that's the amount we want. Boom. They don't, it's not like they're going to review the terms of the deal again. And then there's a final instruction. Uh, this will serve as a payoff, again, and demand statement. So, oh, look at that. It scrolled over here. No, I was over there. That's good. So you can see we weren't really leaving anything out. And then the following clause must be included in the deed conveying the property to the purchaser. Um, it looks like it's been left blank. So let me now go over. That was a pretty thorough rundown of what a, um, an approval letter could look like. And let me say, in California, it might not matter in terms of if you're concerned about the remaining loan balance. Because in California, uh, about uh, two summers ago, I think it was July of 11, we passed 580E. And 580E says that the lender agrees to a short sale and agrees to release the remaining loan balance. So by law, uh, by California law, that happens. Now, I've seen a lender or two say they're not going to be bound by California. I've seen one lender, let me just be specific, say that because they're bound by federal law, they're not really feeling bound by California law. Uh, but almost all the other major lenders seem to agree. And most of them have conformed their approval letters to that law. But one, they're... You know, so it's bootstraps and suspenders would be law and contract. Uh, most people want to do a short sale. It's better than a foreclosure on the record. So a lot of people just elect to go, the law is good enough for me, if you can't get the language in a timely fashion. And, and, and we can usually get the language, but you can't always get the language. Um, now, if you're out of California and you don't have a law, like Florida did not have when I was practicing there, did not have a, uh, actually own properties there. Pro I bought $70,000 through the closing to, to get out of Florida without uh, 
any, well, basically didn't harm my credit and I didn't owe anybody any money by bringing $70,000 to my last closing on an, on an investment property. Um, in California, Florida does not have any sort of anti-deficiency uh, law. At the time I was licensed to practice, and I still think that's the case, you can check it out. Uh, maybe so I don't have to do this, I should just go ahead and do their, uh, their continuing education requirements. But anyway, so in, in a lot of states, especially back east, there is no language automatically releasing you from liability. So if the question became, what is this piece of paper doing? I would say as a California attorney, prior to 580E, this, this was insufficient for my clients to feel released from the remaining loan balance. Now, uh, we have, uh, it, it can get complicated when we see more of them, we'll go into it. California has, uh, we have, we have non-recourse loans and we have recourse loans. And uh, a non-recourse loan, you might have even said, hey, regardless of the language here, and if 580 didn't exist, it's still a non-recourse loan. You agreed to the short sale, which is the equivalent of like a loan mod, therefore you can't come after me. And we've had subsequent cases, not Supreme Court cases, sort of confirming that logic. But I don't think we need to get into that here on this video because we can say, look, even if the contract writing is not sufficient, we're protected by CCP 580E in California. If you're not in California, I can't um, advise you uh, that this would be good anyway. I would still go and talk to a professional or look it up on the internet to see if there's any law that says I'm automatically released from liability for the remaining loan balance. If not, then is the language here sufficient to make me think that? And I would say that there's a slight chance you could argue full release of liability of the lien would also automatically apply to your situation with this lender, but you know that would be a stretch. So I would want to have better language. I would want to talk to my lawyer about whether I need better language to feel fully released from the remaining loan balance. Okay, so that's liability for loan balance. Now let's talk about liability for taxation. Uh, and we're going to talk, first we'll talk in general, nationally, and um, it seems that the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act that was passed uh, like the first week of January in 2013 has not been passed yet and we're still in 2013 December for 2014 on the federal level. So in California if this is a uh, non-recourse loan you may not have to worry about uh, paying a uh, proper an income tax on the uh, Let's say it's sixty. Let's say it's six hundred forty thousand versus seven hundred thousand. So there's sixty thousand uh, dollars potential loan forgiveness a, a lender might um, send you. And if you um, can show that you have a non-recourse loan and you sell it, the short sale in the proper timing and the proper format that the IRS has advised in some Texas cases, I think you would say. Therefore, I don't have any. Uh, liability for paying income taxes to the feds and non-recourse loans concept would also apply to California. If you, it's not a non-recourse loan, if it's a recourse loan uh, and you've settled this file and you don't have and you can't rely on the mortgage debt forgiveness relief anymore because that law is expired, you could be liable for you know, you're going to get a 1099 for, let's say, 60000 or whatever the net is to the bank. And maybe you, maybe you owe them $750,000. So um, let's say you get a $100,000 1099. What are your options? Well, let me just go over the general ones. There, there is, if you owe, if you're insolvent at the time, again, you want to go to your tax guy and make sure you're following the insolvency rules if you're concerned about taxes, but you, you would say I'm insolvent, therefore that 1099 won't cause a tax hit for me. Uh, it won't make me liable to pay money on that. Um, you might be able to, if you've been renting the property out, you might say, and again, talk to your tax advisor. You can talk to us about it. I've got all the, uh, if you're a client, I've got all the, uh, the tax, uh, the, um, links and PDFs from the IRS, not all, maybe not all, but I have a lot of them on this issue. And you could say, well, I put the property, put a $750,000 property into service, and I'm only getting 
50 back or whatever it is, and that happens to match up with the uh, loan forgiveness amount. So the gain that's being reported as loan forgiveness should offset the loss that came from my business property. But again, you probably do want to talk to your tax guy because you still may have liability for uh, depreciation or uh, some other things. And th there's, a, there's a lot of variables. I just gave you one issue offsetting, but there can be other things that go into your tax liability if you set this up as a business. Um, what else could you dispute to try to take yourself out of tax liability on this? Well, th this is, again, you definitely want to talk to an attorney about this because this could be a little on the aggressive side. But if you dispute the debt, then when you settle a disputed debt, there should not be, there, there's arguably no tax liability. I um, just, you know, long time ago, uh, I graduated from law school and I had 90,000 student loans. Uh, my dad, after I helped him uh, out on a, on a case, paid off half of them. And no, 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 he paid off uh, 15, he only paid off 15 of it. Uh, my, the ones that had the high interest rates at the time at nine. And uh, I guess I paid a little down over time. I was down to 55000 I, I was a, only a lawyer then. I was a realtor. And I, I had a pretty big case. And I paid off the 55000 And then like two years later, some student loan person came after me and said I still had 2000 or $2,500. Um, I argued with him. I said I settled with you. I sent money to your company. You guys said that's all I owed you. Um, that was... And I even had, then they, I, it was lucky for me, they came back and said, oh, you still owe us $400 more. We calculated the principal. And I said on that. And then they even had the guts to come back to me one more time and say, well, you still owe me like $80. And that time I said, this is an accord of satisfaction because they were kicking me off and I sent it over and they accepted it. And two years later, they come back and said, I still owe them $2,000. It was $2,000 plus interest. Maybe it was $2,500. And um, I said, oh, you know, you got to stop bugging me. And I, I gave him a tiny a token amount. I don't even remember, but it was a token amount to just get them to go away. Because lawyers were used to just paying over token amounts, so people would close out their files. We know that the collection person gets a bonus or whatever they're evaluated on is a success. And, it, and it, when you're lucky, like if you're compromising a second, you don't see too many of these token closings anymore. But if you if you can make a legal issue out of something, then you can get to the token closing. So I got to the token closing with them. I paid them. And then I had tax liability at the end of the year. Uh, they sent it out as income. I got this piece of paper, and I said, what is this? I, I was a young lawyer at the time. This was in the 90s. And uh, I, I, I was like, I called them up. I, I, was, I was livid. I was like, we didn't agree that you're going to send this to me. This was, this was a token amount because it was disputed, and you guys went away, and I paid your company in full for the once. And then three arguments later, I paid your company in full four times. Now stop it. And that didn't matter, but I had to look it up. And I read that if you have a disputed debt and you compromise it, uh, you don't have to pay, you don't have liability on that debt. And I don't remember exactly because it was a long time ago, but I think I probably attached a little note on my tax forms and sent it in. Now, if you go on the internet, you see all sorts of people saying, oh, your tax form has to be perfect and you better not attach little notes. And, you know, um, I've advised people. Just whether it's in any life, including the IRS, is you, you you deal with the issue head on. You don't try to hide and disguise it in in, in odd tax forms and, and disclosures and uh, on, on you know I, I even forget I'm out of tax. I'm gonna have to get the tax rate soon. But you don't you don't try to hide it. If you're right, if you got the law on your side, you deal with it right up front. You say, hey, pursuant to this law, and I have it on one of my websites. Uh, compromised debt it does not create phantom income tax. And um, that's what you would use here. But I wouldn't just do a short sale and say later, oh, it's disputed. I would think I'd set up the whole short sale from the beginning as compromising a disputed debt. Uh, I think the more clear you make it, the easier time you would have with the IRS. So uh, again, dealing with the taxes, with the feds, you've got the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act expiring. If you've got a non-recourse debt and you compromise it the way the IRS suggests in the in the t Texas non-recourse loan cases, I think you'd probably expect to be good there and not owe any money. If if you don't have a non-recourse loan, if you have a recourse loan, then you want to look to some of the exceptions. There's seven or eight of them. I have them on websites, uh, but you know the ones I like to look at would be uh, 
it, are you insolvent or have you put it in you know the property in the service of a business and if you can't find any of the exceptions working for you you might want to consider uh, disputing the debt. All right so um, once again it's John McConnell. I'm going to post this video on Google Plus and at favoritrealestate.com. I that well let me go over a oh I left out one thing. What about California? Well California is sort of a similar um, analysis. So California to my knowledge, although they were talking about it, didn't even pass the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act. Uh, I don't know whether they called it the reconciliation or it meant it was going to mirror the feds. I don't even believe they passed it for 2013. It didn't show up. Uh, when I was reviewing this for short set of lines, it didn't show up on the last time I had a non uh, a recourse loan. And I don't think anything happened since then. And uh, therefore, it may even be less likely that it passes in 2014. So that, again, if you're dealing with and you know, if you're looking at a six-figure 1099, uh, the way California's tax code is, that could be 10 percent or more uh, hit on that number. So you want to be very careful before doing a short sale in California because you get a Fed and state liability. Again, you want to make sure you know the difference and when it applies and how you settle the matter on non-recourse versus recourse loans. You'd want to see if you're insolvent. You'd want to see. Well, there's always bankruptcy. I left that out of the other one. A lot of people with six figure 1099s, unless they're missing their job, probably don't qualify for a bankruptcy that they'd want to do. Um, so let, let me review, review it again. So you're going to, you're, you're, the framework is, oh, I'm getting tax liability. Can I dispute the debt? Is this overstated? How do I talk about how much they actually deserve? That's, that's another issue we can discuss some other time. Um, maybe you would argue that the amount of the 1099 is off. Um, two, is a recourse versus non recourse loan? How would that help you? Are you insolvent? Can you dispute the debt? Did your property put the property in service of a business? And there are other exceptions. Uh, one of them is a farm property that I, I as I've choked before and people have commented, you know, I don't know anything about the farm property one, um, but it could be important for people. So anyway, that is uh, our first Google Hangout being recorded. Let me uh, let me see if I can go back and say goodbye in, in person here. So if I click on that. Yeah, there it is. Thanks, John McConnell. Uh, I hope you uh, didn't mind a Saturday morning broadcasting from the home office. Uh, I happen to know that I'm getting a tremendous, you know, sort of, I don't know if it's high end or high end for me, Mike. I'm going to have that in my office. I'm going to have a bigger desk in my office, and we're going to make it look a little bit more interesting. Uh, although here, you know, what could be more interesting than a camera that takes a shot of a, a mirror in the background and a, a bookcase? No. Um, well, that, once again, thanks, John McConnell, favoritrealestate.com. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, contracts, real estate contracts, uh, transact, I like to focus the real estate on either asset protection or on transactions. So if you're in a short sale or if you're selling a high-end property or really any property and you want your contract reviewed instead of just uh, you know dealing with a realtor who's really not – realtors are not allowed to write into contracts in California. They are not really allowed to comment on it. I you know, as a realtor, when I was in Florida, I was there for three years before I passed the bar in Florida, I told people, hey, this is an escrow, this is complicated language that this contract says directing, directing escrow to do something. I would have escrow's lawyer review it with me, go over it with me. I know realtors step in all the time, tell you to go ahead and close and all this stuff, but, you know, sometimes transactions get a little complicated. If you want to have a lawyer on your team, just contact us first. We can get a referral for that payment from your realtor that we then contact, you, you probably have a favorite realtor, I can call them and say, I got a referral for you. 90% of them, maybe 99% of them will say yes. You get a lawyer on your deal for free. So once again, John McConnell and uh, Jay McConnell at Gmail, John at favoritrealestate.com or 760-896-4663. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye.